Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show. Discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Hosted by Desiree Duffy. It is time to get booky with it. Welcome, everyone, to Books That Make You. I'm your host, Desiree Duffy, and we are talking about books that make you live inside of a fairy tale. We all love fairy tales, right? What little girl or boy didn't dream of being a princess or a prince, slaying dragons and trapsing out on their quests to become a hero? Who didn't just want to step right into that glass slipper right along with Cinderella to see if it fit? We all did. Today, our guest is someone who reinvented the classic story. Her book is called The Souls of Her Feet. In it, our Cinderella is a middle American teenager, modern day, and she's got body images as well as the usual step problem. This very sweet but twisted version of our beloved Cinderella fairy tale it just bristles and bubbles with fresh character interpretations and a really interesting plot point and laugh out loud. It is so hilarious. Illusions that take us back to the original story that we all know so well. Kristen Cavan is an awarded essayist, cartoonist, and playwright. She also writes novels, lyrics, poetry, and choreography. She is a lecturer, a performer, a dance teacher, as well as a nonfiction writer on big picture wellness dynamics. Long before the world became Cinderella obsessed, Kristen admired the protagonist's stoic optimism. And she wanted to explore the beloved tale with some added humor and fresh emotion and even some psychological insight. She writes about ADHD in her blog. She's also the co-author of three self-help and parenting books, including The Bullying Antidote. And she has also published two memoirs about being a cartoonist. This woman has got a lot going on. Kristen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Desiree. I'm very happy to be here. This is going to be fun. The whole idea of taking a fairy tale and giving it a modern day twist. Why Cinderella? How did you come up with that idea for your book? I think I came up with the idea while I was literally scrubbing a kitchen floor. <laughs> Just like Cinderella, <laughs> right? <laughs> I had a stepmother and... um Anybody who's been raised in a mixed family knows that, um, you know, that doesn't mean anything on its own. But if you have a, a family where everyone communicates really well, um, it's a good thing. And if you have a family where people communicate by shouting at each other, that's kind of hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, so I um, we had a lot of struggles um, about doing chores. And yet I, I, I grew from, you know, my terrible experience of having to actually literally scrub a kitchen floor once in a while. And to all of you out there who have never done it, it's really not that hard. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> so I, um, I didn't get the idea of writing a book about it until um, it's kind of funny because I had a, I, I was sort of going through a Cinderella phase and while I was in college and exploring um, the archetypes that we apply to our lives and I have a degree in mythology and of course I was wondering why we need that and why we need these stories and why we relate to them so strongly so I was exploring a lot of different stories um, goddesses and every woman was a, a book that I was reading by Jean Shinoda Bolin and then I had a friend who was obsessed with Snow White and I thought oh you've got a Snow White thing I've got a Cinderella thing um I should write something about this. Well, I started out writing a comic book and then I wrote an opera and then it turned into a musical (laughs) and now it's a novel. So, um, that's a great (laughs) journey for this book. I I love it. And fairy tale journey kind of. Yes. Yeah. Because you are absolutely correct. So many of our stories, let's face it, stories. There's only so many stories actually in the world. 
all of them are retold and many of them are inspired by mythology and we've all heard of the heroes as well as the heroine's journey and being able to identify with an archetype it sounds like you and your friend in college were identifying with people or characters I should say that you could relate to because of your current situation sure and so why don't you tell us a little bit more about some of the psychological insights that you found with Cinderella or with any of the other archetypes that you, you studied? Well, let's just talk about Cinderella because I could talk about this book and the characters Ashley and Harry forever. I love them so dearly. I like Cinderella because it's really and it's, it's a story about ascendancy, about someone who starts in a place that is unhappy and moves to a place of true happiness. And I think that's the essence of a lot of fairy tales, not all of them. But Cinderella is iconic for that reason and probably everyone's favorite. It's really the most retold story, um, fairy tale. Uh, it's, it's the first one everyone starts with. Um, it was the first one that I started with and, um, there's, <laughs> there was a movie director, I think, you know, the, like the, um, you know the movie Pretty Women with Julia Roberts? Sure. That was written by Mike Nichols, and he says it's a Cinderella story because Cinderella always works. Mm-hmm. The thing about Cinderella that is so pure, um, where she's a good person and her purity wins out, um, her pureness of heart. And I think that's something that we all relate to um, because we all try to be really good people. And it doesn't always work. And um, we're sometimes surrounded by people who don't get us. And so I think it's very eternal for that reason. Um, It's a story that gives us hope that someday we'll get to go to the ball. Yes, and especially young girls, young women at that age where they're still trying to figure things out. The the dream of going to the ball, meeting Prince Charming. Even in in Cinderella's case, she was she was not wealthy. She was not of that, you know, societal status. So to have somebody come and grant her every wish, her fairy godmother because she's deserving of it. That's the thing going back to the purity right. thing. She, she deserved it. it. Yeah. yeah. Rather yeah. than just getting it handed to you. So and, and let's unwrap some of the the big issues that you have tackled in this retelling because you you go into body image to a large degree and you're talking about young girls in middle america who are going through this right now today can you talk about that a little bit oh sure okay first of all everybody has body image issues the the most perfect people not that perfection is any one thing it's a moving you know, it's a, a moving definition um, because everybody's perfect in their own way. But the most sort of ideal figures um, have body image issues. And I wanted to have a little fun with that. Um, you know how in the Cinderella um, fairy tale, her feet are so tiny that nobody can fit into her shoes? Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. If she's, like, working in the fields all the time and, like, doing all this work, what if it just made her feet, like, really wide and flat? So that like she, you know, like none of those like fancy girls could fit into her big old tennis shoes, but um, so I actually, I actually gave her really big feet, and so it's kind of an odd, you know, body image quirk. There are there are girls out there who have big feet, and like I met someone um, in a bookstore who was like four feet eleven, and she had size nine feet. Well, Ashley, Ashley just has really big feet, and um. But she has self-esteem issues, not just for the big feet, but, you know, just how others treat her as um, a second-class citizen or as somebody who's not worthy and just treat her without respect, um, Mm -hmm. without just human kindness. And she knows that she deserves more because she had a great relationship with her parents. That's another thing that you find a lot in fairy tales is everybody's an orphan. And I think, you know, that gives a person a clean slate. Um, I don't know why, you know, those of us who have plenty of parents still, you know, are attracted to these orphans, but there's something (laughs) about that. So every superhero has a a difficult backstory, too, and there's a lot of them who are orphans. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the cliche, right? You have to kill the parents or get rid of the parents. <laughs> yeah, it's an archetypal thing just yeah. to see who you really are without them. Exactly. And I just want to add, the struggle was real for me when I was growing up. I had big feet. And really? it's, I, I did. And it was a real thing. You, you are so spot on. You, you, you know, it seems like of all the things to have, big feet. But I remember, true story, if you don't mind, really quick. I, I wore these tennis shoes to a high school basketball game while I was still in eighth grade with my friend. And we were going to high school the following year. So it was our chance to see what it was all about. And I remember to this day the friend who I went with saying, you should not wear tennis shoes. Your feet are too big. And that stung. And it stuck with me to this day. I don't own a pair of tennis shoes because my feet are too big for them. I love that story. That's so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and so I identify with your Cinderella already. I get it. I get it. Well, so you will understand how difficult it would be to find a pair of fabulous shoes in your size when you suddenly had to go to the prom like the next night. You weren't expecting to, and then someone makes you go. Yep, yep. Oh, I have a size 10. To this day, I had a size 10 in eighth grade, and I remember all of, you know, always trying to find pretty pumps and pretty sandals, and they never had them in my size. A lot of times they only went up to size 9, so I get it. <laughs> oh, so wait till you read this book, because the way she gets her shoes is kind of beyond belief. <laughs> I don't want to give anything away. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm excited. Her I'm fairy excited. godmother is to die for, is going to be America's favorite one of these days, I tell you. <laughs> um, yes, so there's there's a bit of shoe, um, well, I don't want to say shoe porn because, you know, <laughs> it is like a YA novel, but there's definitely um, shoe obsession and shoe fantasy very, very deeply in the heart of this of this little novel. <laughs> so, and if you like shoes, <laughs> if you love shoes, you'll love this book. That's great, That's, especially vintage vintage shoes too. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with be, with it being a YA novel, here's the thing: I like reading YA, and I'm certainly not a young adult anymore. So, who do you feel should or, or could read this book? So that's a good question because I really do feel like it's it's really for anybody who has ever <laughs> who has ever you know loved this story or who just likes good stories. Um, just because it's a fairy tale doesn't mean it has to be YA. Just because it's about a seventeen year old doesn't mean it has to be for ages thirteen um, or twelve or thirteen. YA is a very specific age range. Um, they have. You know, when you're classifying a book, it's very difficult because they, they market them very narrowly, like YA is, and I'm not very good at it, <laughs> mm -hmm. age 13 and up, and then young adult is 18 and up or something. And, you know, there's there's a lot of characters in this novel of different ages. and um, But it's mostly about, it's set in high school. Mm-hmm. It's the thing about it not being like technically YA is it has the B word in it. So you can read this book if you're 12 or 13, but like if that word's going to shock you, you might, if you're a little younger, that word might shock you. But um, so it has a little bit of light language in it. Um, but other than that, it's um, it's it's pretty G rated um, or at least PG. Um, but it's something that like 70 year old ladies adore this book <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well and it's got a lot of humor in it too uh, yeah it's very universal and it's really a family story anybody who's ever had a family or you know overcome anything and yes it has a lot a lot of humor in it and i should also mention that it has a character in it who is gay and you know that's something that was a little edgy back when I started writing it, but now it's like, yeah, every family has someone in it who's LGBTQ. And so it's very friendly in that regard. It, um, you know, it just really mainstreams the difference of everyone. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the way, because you have written more than just this one YA book. You have a blog on ADHD, you have co-authored and worked on other self-help books, including the bullying antidote. So I have to imagine that you pulled some of that research into this book as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I've been, um, 
I've been co-writing, um, editing, um, developing books with my mom for, oh. for decades. And she is a community psychologist. Um, so she is a teacher, an educator who teaches, um, parenting. And so she, her first book was a parenting book, The Winning Family. And her second book was On the Wings of Self-Esteem. And then her third book, um, which I also co-wrote, I, is called The Bullying Antidote. And it actually came out the same year as The Soles of Her Feet first came out. So it was, um, it was really, um, quite a year um but cinderella really is like america you know the world's original bullied teenager so sure so with a tie in there um and and it, it does have a lot of psychological insight um pretty and i'll just give you a little fast forward to the end of the bullying antidote one of the um biggest things that research shows across the board that helps kids or adults who are either bullying people or being bullied is learning assertiveness skills. Mm -hmm. You know, just really clear asking and refusal skills, um, you know, standing up for yourself, you know, in your own power um, and being respectful um, of other people's power. That that's something that helps in all situations. And that's the big lesson that um, Ashley needs to learn in this book. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of an inside look at how um, how Ashley overcomes her self esteem issues and is able to rise up into her greater reality. I admire that theme. That's such a great message for young girls and for young boys too nowadays. And tell me a little bit too about you. You have a blog about ADHD. You want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, I actually, it's not my blog, but I have been a blogger. I did a blog for a long time for Attitude Magazine. And if anybody out there has ADHD and doesn't know about this magazine, you need to subscribe right now. It's ADD, like capital ADD, Attitude, I think AttitudeMag.com. And um, they just offer so many articles and so much support that helps you see that um, it's perfectly normal. It's just a difference, and there's ways of understanding it and ways that are working with it. My blog was called Life in the Fast Brain, mm. <laughs> and I think they just changed their format, so you can't search for Life in the Fast Brain anymore. But you can search for me and see um, all the posts that I wrote for it. And my own adventures with um, parenting and working in schools and, and discovering that, oh, hey, that's that's how that it sounded so familiar to me and learning at a late age um, in life that I had always had it. And um, that's which is a very common story for parents these days. Yeah, I, I understand completely. I've actually worked with other authors who have written books or they themselves have ADHD. And it's a it's a great thing that you're you know helping distribute that message out there and i i actually i have i'm familiar with attitude magazine so i know oh, exactly what you're talking about isn't it great? yeah it Good. is it is and then what what i think is interesting about you as a person as a writer is you're pulling in so much of your experience from so many different areas you're uh you written poetry, chore you've done choreography. Um, can, you want to talk about just how you pulled in some of your other areas of expertise to, and infuse sure. them into your writing? Well, um, that's a great question. I love that question. I am very deeply a humanist and um, a holistic, I take a holistic perspective of life and everything. And um, I... Um, Oh, where to begin? Well, so we could just start with the ADHD. The one of the ways I've always treated my own ADHD is with creativity. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one reason that I have such an outpouring of it and such a, um, um, such a wide variety of things that I do because you know, it's the novelty seeking brain. Mm -hmm. And yet at the core of everything that I do and every expression, I'm just very interested in self expression and, and finding, finding like, excellent or high level um 
articulation in all different in every form that I can. Um, so that's my my greater artistic and creative pursuit. So all of these different forms are just um, just all parts of the you know they're all branches of the same tree. They absolutely are. You're you're a creative person, and it's being expre- expressed in so many wonderful different ways. So tell me, what where where is it going next? Do you have book two in the works? Are you working on a different project? Are you dancing? Where can we follow yes. you next? Yes. <laughs> yes. And lots more. Um, so where you can follow me. Well, first of all, if you like um, The Souls of Her Feet, you can go to thesoulsofherfeet.com. And um, you can read excerpts of it. I'm, I'm publishing like little behind the scenes excerpts you know, from the novel with little stories from my own life. And that's a very fun thing you can do to stay in touch with me. Um, I also have my own website, kristencavin.com, where I, I try and keep everything together under one umbrella. <laughs> but um, what I'm doing next is, let's see, my immediate next is um, I'm presenting on a couple panels at um, writing conferences. Um, I'm going to be leading a panel about the canon and liberal arts. And by the way, I consider myself a liberal artist, like liberal as in lots of (laughs) (laughs) and free thinking and having to do with books. So that, um, but what I'm really, but I am working on the sequel. Um, and because just a little bit more about the story is, is the overall, trilogy is called the fairy tale reality project and it's just perfect for your topic i'm so happy that you called me (laughs) but what's different about this trilogy is you probably figured out by our conversation is there's no magic in it the magic of it is actually you know the the spiritual work and the psychological work and the coincidence of of the right person showing up at the right time which which happens when you're in the flow in a good life and you're on your path so um, it's these three friends um, in college, and they have a professor of mythology who's um, asked, who always asks her students, when in your life have you felt like you're living in a fairy tale? Because we all have those moments of like, oh, my gosh, that thing that just happened, <laughs> it mm-hmm. reminds me of yada, yada, like the princess and the frog, right? Like I, like I, I kissed this frog and he's with my prince um, or whatever. <laughs> So all of this sort of centers on, there's a website you can go to called fairytalereality.com. Um, there's a link to it on the other side. And I think it's very dash tale reality. Um, but you can actually like find a fairy tale and make a comment like, oh yeah, I had that experience of being the gingerbread man where someone was like trying to eat me while I was helping. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been and, there, right? <laughs> I'm helping right, you. So, no, I'm going to eat you. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> so these three, these three girlfriends, Ashley St. Helens, um, she has a, a high school story where like her life was like creepy, like Cinderella. And then the next one is Nevada LeBlanc, snowy white, um, no relation to Matt. Um, and she's um, a sophomore in college and she has a snow white, problem and then the third one way down the road is going to be um about uh linda lovegood who has a a a beastly kind of man that she's trying to be in relationship with so um it's going to take me about five years to get them all out but i have got the first draft of mirror imagine down and i'm going to be doing a rewrite this year and hopefully it'll be out next year That is brilliant. Well, you need to come back when you have the next book and then the book after that. We're going to talk to you again and again because there's so much there. This is just delightful. I love what you're doing with this. And I admire how you're helping inspire and uplift young girls and young men as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are welcome. So once again, can you tell people where they can find you online, your website, find your book, social media, all that good stuff? Okay. So just one website, thesoulsofherfeet.com. There's links to everything there. You can find my website from there. Um, You can find the Facebook page that is related to this book. It's called Shoe and Tell, and it's where um, people, like, if you have a story about 
your shoes, you can actually share it on this page. Oh, and don't just post pictures of your shoes. You have to tell a story. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so that's basically where you go. Um, the soles of her feet dot, dot com. And on Facebook, I'm Kristen Cavins Imagination. And when you're speaking, do you speak to, I know you're doing some writers conferences, but do you speak to schools or other organizations? If they invite me. I think people should be inviting you to speak, too, because I can imagine you being an excellent lecturer at schools, universities, all the way down to grade school, or just different organizations, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, etc. I've done readings of this book in bookstores, libraries, um, shoe stores, party. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> Fabulous mansions, um, and whenever I do a reading of this book, I insist that everybody wears a pair of shoes that has a story. And so I'll read a little bit from the book, but then we'll spend the whole time talking about everyone's stories, about where their shoes have taken them. <laughs> That's excellent. If your shoes could talk, what stories <laughs> exactly. would they tell? <laughs> yeah. Kristen, thank you so much. I enjoyed every moment of our conversation today. Thank you for joining us on Books That Make You. Thank you so much for finding me. I love this. And um, click, click your heels. I will click my heels and we'll invite you back again real soon to talk about your next book. Once again, everyone, my name is Desiree Duffy. And thank you for being with us here today on Books That Make You. You can find out more about us on our website. That is booksthatmakeyou.com. You can also follow on Facebook and Instagram and don't forget to sign up for our newsletter because we are always giving away lots of bookish goodies. There's books, of course, and things that go with books and things that all bibliophiles just love. So once again, that's books that make you dot com. And we're on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The executive producer for Books That Make You is Desiree Duffy. Produced and sound mastered by Phil Jean Grande. Engineering by Dave Nabox. Social media and promotion by Bree Sweeter. For more, visit booksthatmakeyou.com.